Okay, welcome to this webinar um, that is on uh, what can we learn from national COVID-19 control policies. And this uh, webinar is arranged by the U21 Health Science Group. Um, and um, as you can see, we're going to introduce our panelists later, but we have uh, researchers from Lund in Sweden, Fudan University in Shanghai, China, University of Johannesburg in South Africa, University College Dublin in Ireland, McMaster University in Canada, and um, one researcher from Lund who's also uh, very active in Lebanon. Uh, after the panel members have given um, their short um, uh, their short presentations, uh, we will have a panel discussion with the Q and A. And you are welcome to um, ask your questions uh, during in the Q and A tool, which is pretty much uh, on the. I guess everybody has it on the bottom pane of their screen. Um, you can chat with each other um, through the chat uh, while listening. And I would implore you to set the speaker view, not the gallery view, while listening to the different speakers. And uh, we are also streaming this uh, at the U21 ASG Facebook page. And if you like, you can, just as the almighty Trump, tweet, and then you use the hashtag U21 ASGP Public Health 20. Um, very hard to actually say that. Uh, but um, with that, I think uh, we can introduce the panel members. And uh, I am Associate Professor Martin Stofström, um, also the chair of the U21 Health Science Group Public uh, Groups Public Health Discipline Group, and I work at Lund University in Sweden. Uh, Lund University is situated in the very, very south of the country. Um, from Fudan University. Uh, we have Prof Associate Professor Ihan Lu. Uh, would you like to say hi, Ihan? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, and from, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, from University of Johannesburg, Martha. Hi, everyone. And from University College Dublin, Carla. Hi, everybody. Carla here from Dublin. And from McMaster University, Elizabeth. Good morning for everybody in Canada. And um, from Lund, but also Lebanon, Jade. Hi, everyone. Who's actually sitting in Denmark? But that's another issue. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, just to take us or start us off, um, as you can see from this picture, we, we have different countries here uh, with somewhat similar tra trajectories in terms of how the, how, how the pandemic has evolved, with Lebanon and China being outliers in that, and South Africa starting on quite late. Um, it's interesting to see how some countries went into complete lockdown, some into partial, and some only recommended social distancing. Yet these countries have, ha have all had quite different ways uh, to tackle the COVID-19 situation uh, with the, their domestic policies. Um, and even so, we can see these quite similar trajectories. 
Now, as the pandemic progress, international collaboration is becoming even more important. We need to share information systems, drug and vaccine development uh, in order to tackle this, tackle uh, the future of COVID-19. Thus, it is important that we both understand and learn from each other in terms of how and why countries have tackled COVID-19 the way they actually have in the past few months. The more we communicate and collaborate in the time to come, the more we will be able to tackle COVID-19 in the future. Um, and with that, I would like us to um, start our presentations. Hi, my name is Martin Stofström and I am an associate professor of public health at Lund University in Sweden. Sweden is a country with a population of about 10.4 million and situated in Northern Europe. It is one of the largest countries in Europe area wise with a population centered to the southern third of the country. Sweden has a very high life expectancy and a large aging population. This is to a great extent a result of a very solid welfare state that amongst other things include a tax funded healthcare system. Currently, the government is led by a social democratic prime minister with cabinet members from both the social democrats and the Green Party. The main aim of the Swedish COVID-19 strategy has been to keep transmissions on a level where the healthcare system is manageable. The aim has not, I repeat, not been to eradicate COVID-19 or to accomplish herd immunity. The aim has been shaped by the assumption that COVID-19 will not go away until herd immunity is reached either through natural transmission or vaccination, the virus will need to be managed. The strategy has been shaped by both recommendations and laws. The main mantra by government through the pandemic has been apply social distancing, wash your hands, stay critical to information online, together we will prevail. In order to understand the Swedish COVID-19 strategy, one should be aware of that Sweden has been governed the last 400 years with an approach that makes a clear distinction between the political power and the national and local public agencies. However, these agencies cannot pass laws. They can only recommend. Also, our constitution doesn't allow government to override the parliament, meaning that government couldn't close schools, borders and quarantine those in risk without parliament's approval. So far, only one such law has been passed, and that is to give government the ability, if it sees fit, to close educational institutions. In the end, they chose to close the upper secondary schools and universities. Another important factor was Sweden's preparedness. We had made quite a bit of pandemic modeling and the data showed that closing down society, even for a shorter stint, could be more detrimental in the long term than what we gain in the short. Yet the preparedness in the healthcare sector was quite poor something the National Public Health Authority was unaware of, which is of course one main critique now that has become evident. Finally, those governing the pandemic strategy seems to have decided that it is better to have one strategy that works in the long term, rather than having different strategies for different phases in the pandemic progress. So what were the outcomes? About 65,000 Swedes have tested positive for COVID-19. All in all, about 2,300 patients have been hospitalized in intensive care. Currently, the death toll in Sweden is about 5,200, giving an overall mortality rate of 52 fatalities per 100,000. To a large extent, the fatalities have struck the aging population with more than 90% of the fatalities being among those above the age of 70. As a consequence, the majority of fatalities have not been in hospital settings, but rather in elderly homes. The main aim was reached 
At no point in time were the ICUs overloaded with patients and no patients with immediate healthcare needs were turned away. Also, Sweden has been discussed frequently in international media as there has been no denial that the strategy could lead to herd immunity. Results in Sweden does not indicate that herd immunity is happening anytime soon, with 20% of the population in Stockholm having antibodies and other regions having less. Another important finding is that diagnosed cases and most certainly hospitalizations has been unevenly distributed between different geographical regions. This leads to the conclusion that the strategy was quite effective in regions where the community transmissions had not reached a critical point when the different measures were implemented, while it was ineffective in geographical areas where the community transmission had already gone beyond that particular point with mortality rates ranging from 16 to 100 fatalities per 100,000. Thank you. On this slide, the epidemic of COVID-19 is presented from December to March in mainland China. As we all know, the city of Wuhan, where the first COVID-19 case was identified, was closed off on January 23. The epidemic peaked in late January and then declined in February, which was temporarily associated with the implementation of massive public health interventions in March, actually, the epidemic has been controlled effectively in mainland China. Before the lockdown, there was no strict countermeasure against the COVID-19. After that, strategies were immediately implemented, such as massively testing the virus in at-risk population and general population, tracking, isolating, and treating cases, identifying and tracing every close contact, Finally, we try our best to save lives at all costs. Simultaneously, public health interventions such as traffic restrictions, stay at home and intensive quarantine, and even universal symptom survey in communities have been introduced in every province, city, and village in China, depending on the local risk of transmission. To support the interventions, massive social mobilization has been initiated, including multi-sectoral cooperation and society-wide efforts. Obviously, the main objective is to early identify the cases and then interrupt a possible transmission. The main tools include a very careful epidemiological investigation and extensive social distancing. Chinese government is a big government so we could implement the countermeasures thoroughly and consistently. I have to defend our data quality, especially after the lockdown of Wuhan, and all provinces have initiated the highest level of public health emergency response. This is the epidemic of COVID-19 in Shanghai. Obviously, there are two peaks. The first one is caused by local cases and the second one is imported cases from foreign countries, suggesting the changing pattern of the epidemic. Accordingly, the strategy is changing. For example, we have canceled a lot of international flights to avoid too many imported cases since March. In April and May, the countermeasures became loose in China. We are reopening the economics and uh, normal life. However, on June 11, a new epidemic was identified in Beijing. As of June 23, it involved more than 250 local cases. The city has reinforced the tracking and tracing strategy. Actually, the strategy is always on call in every region in China. In addition, about 3 million people, local people, were tested in 10 days to identify any potential case, especially asymptomatic case. 
so I could not say we have very specific or detailed time scope of the national strategy. For example, no one predicted the pandemic scenery in the world in February, and now more than 8 million cases, right? The COVID-19 is very new to us. We need to learn more and change our strategy accordingly. Now in China, some experts claim we could extend our resumption of work and study. However, many ordinary people believe we should continue to be very careful in the control and prevention of the COVID-19. Obviously, many local governments would like to be cautious, very cautious. So I think we should balance the conventions and normal life dynamically, which may be considered new norms in the near future. Thank you for your listening. Hello, my name is Mata Chajgua from the University of Johannesburg, and I'll be talking about how South Africa has managed the COVID-19 outbreak. South Africa is on the southernmost tip of the African continent, and its population is estimated at about 59 million 308,690 people. The first case of COVID-19 in South Africa was diagnosed on the 18th of March, and this was on someone who had traveled from Italy. From there on, South Africa declared the state of national disaster in terms of the Disaster Management Act and adopted the five-level lockdown approach. The levels were as follows. Level 5 meant drastic measures to contain the spread of the virus and save lives. And this was going to be achieved through lockdown system, closure of borders and staying at home of everybody, no running, no exercises outside. But as you know, in South Africa, this was not possible with all walks of lives. Level four, extreme precautions to limit community transmissions and outbreaks while allowing some activity to resume. At this level, a lot of people got permits to travel and to continue with the business, but restaurants, beer halls were still closed, but a lot of people were walking up and about, even running and exercising in the morning. At level three, restrictions on many activities, including at workplaces and socially to address a high risk of transmission. At this level, people were still getting permits to go to work and people were now free to go for exercises, walk dogs, but still bars and restaurants were not allowed. And this is the level in which South Africa is still at, although they have opened up uh, some uh, restaurants to allow social distancing, but I don't know how far this is going to work. Level two, physical distancing and restrictions on leisure and social activities to prevent a resurgence of the virus. And then finally, we will move to level one, where most normal activities can resume with precautions and health guidelines followed at all times and populations need to be prepared for an increase in an alert if necessary. The main objective of the South African strategy or policy was the reduction of new infections. This was to be achieved through testing of suspected and exposed people. The other major objective was to prepare the health system to cope after scaling down the lockdown. The main tools within the strategy included quarantine of all infected persons, and isolation, treatment, and contact tracing, social distancing of everybody, sanitation and hygiene, and use of appropriate personal protective equipment. For example, the cloth first masks. The time scope of the national strategy was to be implemented as follows. From the 26th of March, 2020, the country went under lockdown in level five. This was supposed to be followed for 21 days until the 16th of April. 
After the 16th of April, there was an extension under level four, which was going to continue until the 31st of May. Currently, the country is under level three, which started on the 1st of June, but the borders are still closed and being closely monitored. Some of the national key concepts that need to be understood in order to understand this strategy that is being implemented in South Africa is as follows. South Africa has the highest COVID-19 testing capacity so far in Africa. And outcomes are as follows. There's been loss of economic livelihoods during this lockdown, and this has threatened the social harmony and also the scaling down of the lockdown has seen even infections continuing on an upward trend. There hasn't been any uh, reduction in new infections. The trend has been going upwards since the 18th of March. The community way to follow strict government regulations for the lockdown, for, for the lockdown to have any impact, but this was impossible considering the way of living in some of the communities in South Africa. And for South Africa to be able to move from one level to the next, the discussion was this was supposed to be guided by the monitoring of new infections, confirmed cases, deaths recorded and tests done. However, this was not achievable as the trend continued to go on an upward level. The COVID-19 cases have been reported from the hospitals and testing centers, and the numbers have been recorded by the South African Statistics Office, and they also have published the, the data. There is a possibility of a bias on this data as some of the cases are likely not to be able to report at any healthy facility or any testing center due to lack of finances. Other political parties have been criticizing this policy and strategy, but it is usually for their political mileage and nothing significant comes out of it, even if this is contested in court. So far, the strategy will follow the loosening of the lockdown standards from the level five to level four, then level three, then level two, and then eventually level one. So to some extent, the strategy was effective, but not totally effective given the current economic situation amongst the greater majority of the communities. I say it was um, effective to some extent because they've been able to procure uh, PPE and they've been able to have hospitals uh, and um, ICUs prepared just in case the numbers go up. I think the country will be able to manage the numbers. My personal opinion, however, is that South Africa has densely populated urban areas and informal settlements and poor communities are at high risk due to living conditions, despite all the efforts by the government. I thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Carla Barotta. I'm assistant professor at the School of Public Health, and I will talk you through the Irish response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the Irish response really was shaped by the ICU bed capacity, which is uh, one of the lowest in, in, in Europe. Um, by week four, uh, with about 300 cases and the number of uh, ICU admissions uh, quickly increasing, it was clear that the bed capacity wouldn't be able to respond to, to the outbreak at that pace. So the decision by the public health emergency team was to lock down the country and to ban all non-essential activities. Um, there was a strong incentive for people to stay at home with a pandemic unemployment payment, which allow people owners of small shops or um, hairdressers or hospitality workers, construction workers to stay at home knowing that they will receive um, a payment during those weeks. Uh, there was a strong communication campaign as well, and really people follow the rules by the book. 
as you can see in the picture, the idea was to uh, delay the epidemic peak, not to either not to crash the curve or not to suppress the virus, but just to delay the epidemic uh, peak. People really did follow, as I said, the rules by the book. Um, the Irish Society uh, has a very strong sense of community. They really work together, especially with this type of challenge, challenge uh, when there is the need of these community spirits and, and they feel that they were all working together towards to uh, reduce the spread of the virus. Um, you can see the, the streets empty. Those were uh, photos from pictures from the from St. Patrick's Day. The lockdown came just a couple of days before St. Patrick's. So we, we can imagine that that's a big celebration in the country. So the morale was a little bit low during those days, but uh, you know, still people really uh, stay at home and you, you can see that uh, no one was really out and about uh, on the streets during those days. Uh, the, that's the epidemic curve and you, you the first um, red line uh, will be when the lockdown started and the second red line uh, was the, the peak of the, of the outbreak. You will see a, a couple of other spikes there, but those were actually lab delays so really the peak was four weeks after the lockdown um, the bed capacity never reached beyond the 60 percent so that was uh, good some hospitals did have kind of almost full capacity for a couple of days um, but they they were able to transfer patients to the, uh, different hospitals and they were kind of hot spots during those uh, weeks with uh, more cases um, we will see in the future um, the impact on the economy, the impact on the mental health of the population and also the impact on non-COVID-19 uh, conditions because the, the, the really the, there was restricted access to healthcare. Um, right now the country is back almost to normal life with this new normal of maintaining the social distancing and physical distancing in the shops and supermarkets and masks are requested for um, public transport and supermarkets um, or shops where you know you can't maintain physical distancing. We will see in the next coming uh, weeks what's happened with the number of cases. For now we have just only a few cases every day and the ICU admissions for the last two weeks, I think there were only one admission during the last two weeks. So that's kind of a positive sign and we will see in the future, especially when travel resumes from the Iceland to Europe and vice versa, we will see how, if we have or not a kind of a new outbreak in the, in the coming weeks, we'll see. Okay, so that will be all from me. Thank you, U21, for organizing this webinar and for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about Canada's and Ontario's response to COVID-19. Canada is a federalist country with 13 provinces and territories, and they're mainly responsible for decision making, especially when it comes to health and health care. We sit right north of the United States of America, and we're quite large geographically. Most of our population lives in the southern part of the country and almost 40% of Canada's population lives in Ontario, which is the province that I'm circling right here in the middle, which says 33,095. That's the number of COVID cases in Ontario as of June 19th. Canada's first documented case of COVID-19 was on January 25th. Now the federal government never declared a state of emergency. This was left up to the provinces and territories. In Ontario, we declared a state of emergency on March 17th. At that time, we had 186 cases and our first death. Most of them were related to travel. Canada's response was to uh, flatten the curve or slow the spread or mitigation. Uh, we didn't want to overwhelm our healthcare system. Considering that Canadians, or at least Ontarians, 
had been talking about health system capacity issues for years before the pandemic. When we saw what was happening in Italy, we took it quite seriously. However, I would say our first policy direction was to wash our hands and not touch our faces. We're not encouraged to wear masks because we lacked protective equipment for our healthcare workers. In Ontario, testing was quite uncoordinated at the beginning. It took a long time to set up assessment centers. Then we had a lack of testing capacity and lack of supplies. And we had very narrow criteria for testing. As far as screening, travelers were asked screening questions about symptoms and travel locations. So if you had been to China, Iran, or Italy, you were asked to self-isolate and notify public health. If you were traveling from anywhere else, you only notified public health if you were symptomatic. As far as travel, uh, we were notified two days before our March break that schools would be closed for two weeks after March break. However, our premier had been encouraging families to travel and enjoy their vacation. However, um, the state of emergency was declared on the Tuesday of March break. So it was quite confusing at that time. We'd had prior experience with SARS, and I think that gave us a false sense of preparedness. You often heard government officials saying, we are low risk and we are prepared because of our experience with SARS. But I believe the public caught on that we really didn't have a good uh, pandemic plan. And many Canadians chose to stay home individually and then government seemed to follow this decision. I would say though that after declaring a state of emergency in Ontario, uh, we did follow good public health expert advice. We've been focused on decreasing the number of deaths and protecting our vulnerable populations, balancing with economic considerations. In Ontario, we have a four phase approach to reopening and most of the province is currently in phase two, which means that most retail shops and restaurants are open but we're supposed to follow public health guidelines. In terms of effectiveness, we had some early projections that showed that in Ontario alone, we might have 100,000 deaths. As you can see in the bottom left corner, as of June 19th, Ontario had 2,564 deaths. There was a poll done in May that showed that 82% of Canadians felt satisfied with the federal government's response to COVID. Now, one interesting thing about Canada is that the majority of our cases and deaths have been in women, unlike most other countries. I wanted to highlight in this middle graph um, some of the countries that we're talking about today. But if you see the black line, that is Canada. We chose mitigation as our approach. Sweden, which is the yellow line, uh, chose herd immunity. And New Zealand, which is this blue line here, chose containment and you can see how each country fared in terms of number of cases per 100,000. Now I'd also like to thank the policy frameworks and impacts on epidemiology of COVID-19 working group. We are working on a very similar project as this webinar looking at policy directions in multiple countries. If you're interested in following our work please see the Twitter handles here. Thank you very much and I look forward to answering questions. This is Jade Khalifi talking about Lebanon's approach to countering COVID-19. The strategy at the national level has been broadly a suppression strategy, which uh, for the first two months or so was uh, more specifically trying to flatten the epidemic curve of COVID-19. And there is now much more recognition that in effect, because of the strong measures involved, uh, this was uh, an attempt to crush the curve. Uh, of the disease by getting the basic reproduction number uh, to well below one and uh, the level of daily cases to zero or at near zero. Uh, the initial response was uh, quite quick after the first uh, case was detected you know, with the uh, travel bans uh, happening and closures of universities, schools, daycares, and most indoor public places and shops and malls and likewise, all happening within uh, uh, one to two weeks of the first detected case. The main tools included the crisis preparedness plan with which a lot of the stakeholders are familiar with, particularly the health authorities, the Ministry of Public Health uh, and others. Considering the previous crises Lebanon has had over the past two decades, uh, there was expanded targeted testing, there was tracing of all contacts of uh, cases, 
uh, contacts had to isol uh, had to quarantine at home for two weeks. Uh, cases had to isolate, if not in the hospital, then at home for two weeks as well. Now there's a, a more direction towards having all cases isolated uh, in a centralized uh, manner. Uh, masks were made mandatory in all public places. Uh, this was particularly as the partial lockdown and traveling restrictions uh, began to be partially uh, or stepwise uh, removed over the past uh, uh, two months. There are a couple of concepts which I would say have influenced the national strategy and one of them being Lebanon um, uh, being one of the crossroads of East and West. And here one of the examples at the start of the crisis was uh, for example, some people pointing at uh, France or the UK and how they were responding to the early uh, outbreak of COVID uh, generally with a more relaxed approach and others then pointing at Asian countries and, and, and talking about the stronger measures that were being put in place there, which uh, in effect uh, turned out to be the, the much more successful approach to countering COVID. So it was good that that was followed. Uh, so again, trying to learn lessons from different places. Uh, there is, of course, the very big influence of the political, financial, economic crisis that has been unfolding in Lebanon since 2019, October. And, and that is, remains probably the biggest factor that will, would um, determine, really, if Lebanon will be able to extinguish COVID or not. There is, uh, it's also a small country which is highly influenced by regional and international uh, politics. Um, and uh, there is also the societal legacy or uh, memories of communities of uh, impact of previous crises, whether they were natural or human made. It's also important to keep in mind the, that one out of every four persons in the country is a refugee and that has a broad system level uh, impact. The data collection has been uh, quite reliable and trustworthy and it's collected uh, by public and private hospitals um, at that level and then reported centrally and released publicly by the Ministry of Public Health. Uh, there are different stakeholders that have been involved in uh, critiquing the national strategy, uh, sometimes constructively, sometimes destructively. Uh, but um, broadly, I would say the, 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 the broad strategy is strongly supported. It's specific policies or certain measures or issues to do with compliance that, that are more the subject. The country is currently opening up uh, and preparing for centralized isolation of cases. There are differences across the regions in terms of uh, measure compliance. Uh, the, in a country of about 6 million people, there's been about 1,500 uh, detected cases and 32 deaths. So I would say it's been very effective uh, in having a strong suppression at the start. Uh, what is still needed for the national strategy is to have uh, uh, to become effective in terms of the long term maintenance with more opening up and more functioning of, of uh, society and, and the economy. So that will remain the major challenge, particularly considering that there's a confluence of crises that at the moment unfolding in Lebanon. So um, the situation remains uh, highly vulnerable. Uh, there are some uh, some more um, measures and documentation I've prepared that uh, link available uh, on this slide. Uh, so there's been a lot of great work done so far um, by the Ministry of Public Health, the health authorities, the people, the government, uh, but still the last five or 10 percent is absolutely necessary to be able to extinguish COVID-19 in uh, Lebanon. Okay, thank you all. Um, now we have received a few questions during our um, small presentations um, and um, some of them are being answered in the chat, <laughs> uh, which is fine. Um, we had uh, one question regarding strains uh, of SARS-CoV-2 and I think Jade answered that one. And we had another question regarding Canadian nurses going off work, which Elizabeth answered in the chat. Um, so um, we received one question. Um, 
and uh, in, in the Q&A right now. So uh, we can start with that one. In South Africa, smoking has not been permitted even in the, this lockdown level three. I need to find out how policies in other countries address smoking. Um, does anyone want to start? How is it with the Nargil in Lebanon? <laughs> because here we're talking smoking with, uh, with, um, which is a driver in, in, um, uh, oh, in, in uh, communicable disease. <laughs> Uh, in, in terms of Lebanon, uh, uh, there um, all the um, uh, water pipe uh, cafes uh, uh, were closed, similar to any other restaurants or, or, or any other uh, uh, similar facilities. Uh, but uh, they, uh, the the country has been stepwise coming out of the the partial lockdown that they had, and uh, about a month ago they started opening these up. And there is a strong movement that particularly these kinds of establishments shouldn't be allowed to reopen, not just for the harm to uh, 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 health that uh, smoking obviously causes, but uh, also because it's a particularly, uh, um, I, it could be a particularly uh, an issue regarding uh, COVID and passing on uh, uh, the disease. So these are still things going on in Lebanon. Are there any other countries where smoking has been banned? Ireland, Canada, no? No, I'm not sure what they mean by ban. I mean, there is, in Ireland, there is a smoking bans in, in, in you know, in closed places where are people working. So that includes restaurants and coffee shops. And they were all closed anyway. So, but I'm not sure what they mean by ban, that they didn't sell cigarettes or, or I, I all right, so it was actually a, <laughs> just to just crush the cardiovascular uh, curve, really. <laughs> okay, no, I no, that didn't happen uh, in Ireland. Okay, ban of all sales of cigarettes. No, that that didn't happen. It's, it's never no. Same in Canada, we didn't have that. Same in Lebanon. I can say that in, in Sweden, it started off with a lot of people um, um, trying to s quit smoking. Uh, we also have smokeless tobacco, which is quite popular. And uh, there, there was a discussion regarding that th those people were better off. And then other reports came out, especially from France, showing that smokers actually survived um, hospitalized smokers had a higher survival rate than hospitalized non-smokers and so now there are clinical studies on whether especially this smokeless tobacco um, looking at the effects of nicotine um, is positive when it comes to uh, outcomes of uh, ICU patients uh, whether that is the case or not I don't know but they're trying to research that uh, we had a question um, relating to possible human rights issues. To what extent should individuals have a right to their own health and mobility? Um, and starting off that, I think we also have to consider, yes, you might have um, rights on your own, but when those rights, um, the, I mean, the whole issue with quarantines have been to, uh, if I can be a possible transmitter of a disease, then uh, whether I should be able to travel or not is not really up to me. It's up to the people who you are um, actually, actually uh, going to transmit with the disease <laughs> because they haven't chosen uh, to be exposed by you. So I think that's one of the key problems with this is that 
we might feel that we have a right to do X, Y, and Z, but as long as we don't know whether we actually uh, are commu communicating a virus to someone else, then maybe we should be much, much more careful than we would normally be in interacting with others. I don't know if anybody else have something to add to that. I think that's that's kind of a valid question, um, and it's it's always a question that arises in infectious disease. You know, we have kind of similar questions uh, when you discuss about TB treatment or uh, tuberculosis treatment, long-term treatment, or uh, blood donation. So. I think it's a valid, a valid point. I think it's on the on the authorities to really put that message across in a way that the public understand the importance uh, of that. And of course, ultimately, you you expect that people will, with that freedom, make the right choice and and protect themselves and others. But uh, it is a valid question. I think. I think a, a common theme. In, at least in Sweden, where we only have applied social distancing and where the recommendations are that people above the age of 70 should stay indoors and pretty much self-isolate, it's not uncommon that you meet older people in Swedish society today, let's say when you go grocery shopping, um, and they become very upset if you get too close to them. And then you get into this discussion, but why are you even here? <laughs> you are supposed to self-isolate. Um, uh, you shouldn't be upset. And then people start discussing whether they should be upset or not uh, because people are coming too close to them uh, because they have opted to go out into open society uh, where they, by making that decision, expose themselves to risks they wouldn't have if they followed the recommendation to stay socially isolated. Um, so we come into these paradoxes all the time, I think. Uh, sorry, go on. Yep. Uh, it, I, I think, uh, I mean, it's very interesting uh, uh, the issue of rights and, and in terms of diseases. Uh, one very important thing is that uh, health authorities should clearly define uh, and assess uh, uh, any disease that is spreading around. But uh, quarantine and isolation by themselves are not that controversial. They're very standard approaches. Most countries have signed on uh, to the Syracuse principles. It's recognized by ECOSOC. Uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that we have had these, uh, the, the, um, these measures uh, historically as well is the reason why the population of the world today is around 8 billion. Otherwise it would have been far less because many would have died off over the past hundreds of years. So, so it's, uh, and it goes into the way that even cities were constructed to enable to close off uh, uh, whenever there was a threat of, of disease coming in. But, but again, it shouldn't be for uh, any disease spreading around. There should be a thorough assessment of this. Uh, um, and of the uncertainty involved, so. Um, we have another question and that is, uh, why do you think we still have very low rates of COVID-19 in Africa? Martha, do you have a opinion or, or Bernard perhaps who has joined us? Thank you so much, uh, Martin. Uh, I think maybe the level of surveillance, it's down to the level of um, surveillance uh, in terms of cluster investigation, the capacity to carry out um, investigations, um, to test and to identify COVID-19 cases, as well as um, possibly the fact that maybe it might not have reached in most parts of um, Africa, the highly populated um, areas um, for example, in rural areas or rural communities. And I think that is part of the reason why, uh, you know, the, the, the figures might appear to be much low. Thank then you, you also find, okay, yeah. then you also find that in some countries where the capacity to 
the surveillance capacity is very high. For example, in South Africa, as well as maybe in Egypt, uh, maybe in Kenya as well, in East Africa, the figures also tend to be a little bit high. So I think maybe it's down to the surveillance capacity of, of, of countries. Yeah, um, but Martin, I think I also agree with Bennett. It's, um, it's a matter of testing. I think they are not doing enough tests. And also, some areas have not been reached. There haven't been anyone who's been infected who has gone to some of the areas. That's my opinion. Thank you. Um, then we have this question. I wanted to know how far the panel thinks public health advice and general government advice can be married and still support health. What are the advantages or disadvantages to this? And can you envision a better policy? Who would like to start that one off? I can, I can say something. Um, so I, I do believe they could be uh, aligned <laughs> in many ways. Um, I think oftentimes we actually create more separation than there needs to be. So I would say in Ontario for COVID specifically, the government has been listening to public health experts quite widely for their decision making. Um, there's lots of other issues though where, um, you know, climate change, all of these other things that you know, it seems like a lot of times they're contradictory. But even with COVID, we have been considering economics. Uh, and that's really important because from a public health perspective, we know that determinants of health affect health. And so if you are uh, socially economically disadvantaged, that does affect your health. So it does, it can't be only one perspective in policy making. So the best policy takes account of public health issues, which is determinants of health generally. So that's what I would say. It can, it doesn't always. I, I can speak from Sweden where it's, politicians have taken a step back and, and pretty much we've been governed by public health, or I would say communicable disease experts, uh, because that's what the people uh, who have run this mainly are. Uh, and I think, I think initially politicians were quite happy with that because not a lot of senior politicians with the exception of, for example, Ireland, have a lot of med medical expertise. Uh, so when you are struck with something that not even having an uncle with an MIT degree is sufficient to tackle, that, then you need, to, um, you need to listen to experts. And in Sweden, we have this system where, where, where authority experts are supposed to make decisions uh, and make public decisions. And politicians are supposed to adhere to those decisions. Um, so they were pretty comfortable with that. Uh, and every politician pretty much signed up to that notion initially. Uh, and then when developments weren't as good as they hoped for, they start to, then it turns, uh, turns into politics, of course. Uh, I, I think one of the interesting things uh, regarding this crisis is that uh, a lot of uh, experts at the start in various countries and internationally got caught on the wrong side of, of being too certain about certain things. And in some of the early uh, uh, calls regarding the, the potential for a pandemic were ignored at different times. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think... Uh, uh, one one thing might be a recognition that it's not enough to have public uh, public health uh, uh, professionals or health professionals involved, but also people across other disciplines. Uh, uh, and one of the lessons, for example, that was given is 
is, uh, for example, engineers, civil engineers typically use in the construction of bridges and how much strain they can hold, or in the construction of sea barriers like there is in the Netherlands. Uh, they, they use uh, approaches such as extreme value theory, and they look at the actual maximum, what's the maximum damage that could happen, and then build onto that, rather than taking the average. So uh, and that, these are kind of interesting concepts and, uh, that can cross-pollinate across disciplines, and I think it would help uh, make countries and the world more resilient in, in face of future outbreaks, because they will happen. That's what I think. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, Martin, you brought up something uh, really interesting. In Sweden, the experts that were being listened to were infectious disease experts, uh, correct? And in Canada, we had public health experts. I think it would be interesting as a topic uh, for you know students on the line who are interested in this kind of research is to see which voices were being heard in policymaking. Uh, because I think even in our example here, infectious disease experts have said things that I, I was going, whoa, hold on. <laughs> From a public health perspective, I'm not so sure that that would fly or that that's really a good idea because it's so siloed. Um, and that's what happens when you get specialists of any kind dealing with any of these health issues is you, you are very focused, very narrow focused. And so I wonder, um, it would be really interesting to look into which expert voices, um, if any, were being listened to policy making. Yes, uh, and I think that's a very important point because there is a question there asking which intervention is, is kind of more successful if containment, flat the curve or just more relaxed approach as the Sweden approach. And I think it's depending who do you ask. If you, are, uh, if you ask an infectious disease, they, you know, probably they will say, you know, just crash the curve, kind of flat the curve. And if you ask like, an economist, they will say, oh, no, no, please, uh, you know, just allow some sort of uh, economy of, of movement in, in the society. So I think we have to define what is success in, in, uh, in COVID-19 in this pandemic uh, and then go from there. I don't know really yet. Um, Martin, if I can also add on to that, um, I think I mentioned it earlier in my presentation that in South Africa, although it was recommended that people should quarantine or self-isolate, it was not always physically possible because we've got families that stay in houses with 10 or 15 um, people in the same house. And this is like a small house where people are sharing this, place, this space. So even if they self-isolate, it means 15 other people are still going to be exposed. And the feasibility of even staying indoors in some of the areas was not even possible. So we were quarantining, but in some areas, it was not physically possible. Ed? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think maybe um, this pandemic has really shown the importance of um, understanding the socio-economic determinants of health and the impact that this could have on addressing any pandemic or any health situation. Because you find that social factors, economic factors are at the core uh, in determining the success of, um, of interventions. Jade, did you have a comment on as well? Uh, yes, just briefly uh, on success and, and also on the trade-offs that we make. Uh, 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 there are some who, who have spoken that uh, uh, usually we, we do make trade-offs, but in, in, a, in a situation such as this, uh, they talk about how uh, the fact that we have an uncertain, uh, there's a very high uncertainty with the, with the type of uh, uh, disease, the outbreak that we are facing, the short and long-term consequences uh, of it. Therefore, normal trade-offs don't apply. This, this respect for uncertainty uh, is, is a major uh, issue. Uh, and it's something that also uh, 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 cut off a lot of modeling uh, uh, on the wrong side as well, because m most of the benefit of modeling is to learn retrospectively what has worked really great. But when you're actually taking action, you, you, you don't necessarily uh, 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 you don't necessarily have to know how effective every single thing is. You put out 10 measures if you can, uh, so long as you reach your goal, and then uh, you can evaluate. So, so there's also this difference between research or 
or um, teasing the evidence versus taking action uh, uh, on the ground? Um, I just want to add that I think we're very early on in this pandemic. <laughs> Personally, I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, basically, we have to live with COVID-19 until everybody has some kind of immunity, uh, most likely from vaccination. Um, so up until then, uh, we have to manage this and, and uh, what what will have been the best way of doing that um, is still not clear. Uh, but if you succeed like uh, New Zealand has to, to more or less extinguish COVID-19 from their islands, uh, I mean, they have to, I read today in The Guardian that there is an uh, debate upcoming on whether you should open the borders or not. Um, so there will be discussions and debates even in those countries regarding are we doing the right thing. Um, so I think from now on until this is under the lid, uh, we will have to make a lot of policy decisions and, and we have to continuously communicate um, with citizens, with people, with people across borders. This is going to take a lot of, a lot of work in the next year, year and a half to whatever it takes. Uh, time has run out. We have several questions. Um, we, we will continue asking and try to answer them for a while. Um, stay on if you can. And uh, we will continue at least for 15 more minutes if it's okay with the panelists. Um, and let's see where we go. Um, Jade? Uh, yes, uh, just a, a small add on. Uh, in terms of uncertainty as well, I think we're taking immunity uh, 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 too, much, um, too much of a certainty because uh, <laughs> the long term immunity of it is not even proven. And, we don't have a vaccine and it might not even be realistic or achievable. Now the latest studies are showing that within two to three months, uh, immunoglobulin G and neutralizing antibodies uh, start decreasing in, in, in cases and persons who had caught the disease. So this is also bad news for herd immunity by any form, even by vaccine. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainties which are not clear now, but they will get clearer. So, uh, uh, I, I would uh, say the more sure approach is to actually go uh, crush it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm reading a question. Um, <laughs> what measures uh, taken by authorities to face the situation of people uh, who are not able to do home working from home? Uh, and are some sort of obligated to go out. Is there any kind of monetary help, food baskets, etc., in our countries? So how do we support people who need to work from home? Um, I think, Martin, that, that's, that's key because some countries can afford that. Uh, like I said, in Ireland, there was a strong incentive for people to stay at home because they, know, they knew that there was a payment in their bank. So, um, but half of the world, uh, it's just uh, the society lives under informal economies where that is not possible. So that's for sure in South America and uh, in Africa and Asia. And so I think that's key. Uh, if you really need to provide for your family, their food or, or you know, just the basic uh, income, uh, I don't know if you can really obey the rules and stay in the house. I don't know what the panel think about that. That was the case in Canada as well. We've had very good economic support, I would say, for, a, and again, how do you define very good? Um, you know, is it cover minimum wage? Does it cover um, sufficient living expenses? That's still debatable, but uh, I would say our governments, both at the provincial and federal level, have both um, 
put in a lot of programs to support financially for both uh, families and individuals and businesses as well. Um, and in South America. Africa? Uh, in South Africa, I can say it's been um, random because there has been a plan to support uh, the families of people that are not able to sustain themselves during this period, especially during the quarantine period. But I don't think it was feasible to actually address all the people because there are also foreigners that are living in South Africa legally and also illegally that were affected. And now the uh, country, I think, was focusing mostly on the legal South African citizens and the legal um, foreign nationals that are staying here and they were getting support, which meant that there was a greater percentage of people which were not being supported. And even those that were South Africans, it's not everyone who was reached. And it made it impossible for people to stay indoors. So people started to hustle and get out as soon as uh, level four was declared. Level four level, was now in level three. Everyone wanted a permit to get out and work for their families. Lebanon? Uh, Lebanon is facing a huge crisis at the moment, or crises, uh, with the political, financial, economic crisis. So, and poverty is increasing massively. Uh, now it's above 60%, and this is a lot of it since October. Uh, so, there are uh, huge problems uh, over there, but uh, um, the government has been distributing to, uh, uh, to um, households uh, of about uh, 300,000 people. Uh, or so are the, the poorest uh, ten percent uh, um, of of uh, of the country uh, um, uh, boxes of supplies uh, uh, food supplies, but still that uh, leaves uh, still a lot being uh, needed and then you have charities and still there are and with the poverty increasing it's a big issue and then there are issues about the accuracy of these lists so uh, a lot has been distributed, but it's not nearly enough uh, so so and, and there is this broad criticism that just saying staying at home without doing anything else is, is not enough, of course, so. Yeah. Uh, next question, when did schools un and universities start doing their no normal activities and has it been safe so far? Um, I can start with Sweden because we kept our schools open except upper secondary and universities, which went online. Uh, and I would say when it comes to schools, uh, we're talking up to the age of 15, 16. Um, there has been, I think, a couple of cases of teachers who have actually turned ill and, um, and um, have died. Uh, but given the number of teachers who have been working, uh, it's probably either very bad luck or that they got transmitted somewhere else because it seems to be um, that this epidemic is not driven by young people. Um, there has been, of course, uh, a number of benefits to that. Uh, also having schools open, kids have been doing productive things during the days, um, not trying to kill each other on the internet uh, only. Uh, but but um, I don't know if there are any other experience from elsewhere where schools have actually opened. No, in Ireland, I think the, the schools were closed from the start of the lockdown and then the holidays, summer holidays, uh, kind of continue from there. So uh, we are really looking at Sweden experience to see how that worked. It, I can tell you that in Sweden we've decided when af already we've decided that after summer holidays, which started a couple of weeks ago, uh, universities will open and uh, and uh, upper secondary schools will open, uh, though social distancing will be a part of it. So it will not open as before, but in the new reality. <laughs> So in South Africa, I think from the 22nd of June, they had uh, the matric, uh, which is like grade 12 and grade sevens who are going to be writing exams this year. They said they can go back to schools. And then the private schools, 
they normally have uh, a low population uh, or low small classes, like 25 students and below, because that's what they were recommending for the classes so that they can allow for the social distancing in the classes. So private schools, I think they allowed their students to come back and the rest of the schools were just said grade 12 and grade seven. But since the 22nd, more than 39 schools have already closed because cases of COVID-19 have been recorded in those schools. I'm not sure about uh, as of today, I'm sure it's more schools that have closed um, after the reopening on this 22nd of June. In Canada, we remain closed. Uh, we, we haven't had the experience of reopening yet. And it's still debatable. Uh, I know for McMaster University, uh, where I teach, uh, we are doing online for the fall term. And um, we have not decided yet what's happening for our elementary and secondary schools yet. Uh, in, in Lebanon, the schools are going to be closed until uh, uh, around October, at least. Uh, they w are thinking of how to so open again and how to uh, apply uh, uh, distancing between students. Uh, half of the students in, uh, in public schools are, are refugees, uh, or children of refugees. So there is a lot of uh, uh, crowding, of course, uh, pre-crowding already in, in uh, the over the national capacity, but uh, I, I don't know what, uh, how they're going to arrange for maybe more facilities or, or some other measures, but it's still uh, unknown. Next question. In countries where English is not the first language, um, I suppose this is from a South African view, uh, has it been easy communicating public health information? Uh, let's uh, change the question into uh, in countries uh, where you need to have uh, public health inf information in other languages than the language that you, you usually speak in that country. <laughs> uh, I think, for example, in Sweden, Swedish is perfect for public health um, information to Swedes. Will work for English people, though. Uh, but uh, I think. Uh, it puts uh, the finger on the question, for example, in migrant populations. Um, has it been difficult for non-English speakers in Canada and Ireland um, or non... Uh, I, South Africa is a bit tricky when it comes to language. Uh, but uh, in Sweden, it has, has most definitely been a problem uh, for migrant population. Um, there was a big, big um, newspaper article yesterday coming out on the difference in um, transmissions between uh, migrant populations and non-migrant or rich populations in Stockholm, uh, the capital. But I guess it's similar in other countries where there are migrant populations not speaking the mother tongue of the nation. Canada, for example, the masters of <laughs> In Canada, we have two official languages, um, French and, and English. So uh, it's, in terms of communication from our government, it is presented in both languages. Um, in terms of other communities, it's harder to say. Um, I don't know that we have any research, any evidence on, on this at this point. But, but I, can I, I say, when we were organizing the contact tracing center, it was clear when you were calling people who were English was not their first language, you know, that was the, where the problem was. Um, usually, uh, again, there were migrants of um, that, you know, many families living in one household uh, with different languages. So uh, the fact that the that uh, contact tracing center was organizing at the university where we have access to, you know, this international uh, crew of students that they were able to kind of step in and, and just answer or contact the, the, you know, the patients or the, the, the trace, the, pe the people that we needed to trace in whatever language that you needed. So you will got an email. So 
which, you know, do you speak Kurdu, uh, Mandarin or Spanish or Portuguese? And people will volunteer to, to address that. But I think that's, that's something that you have to anticipate and have that prepared because, uh, you know, it will come. I would like to add though to that, um, I think language is one barrier, um, but I believe culture is probably just as much of a barrier. Um, we have English speaking people who don't believe COVID is real. That's not a language barrier. <laughs> that's uh, an ideology, that's a culture, I don't know what that is, but but the reality is, um, you know, during Ebola, right, it wasn't just that you're communicating in the language, it's that you have a, a, a way of doing things, you have your culture. And it's really hard to change cultural practices that have been a certain way, right? Um, in Spain and other countries where you kiss each other on the cheek or you have a lot of you know, embracing and a lot of uh, touch. It's really hard to change those social norms. So language I think is one barrier, certainly, uh, but just culture, health literacy, um, the way we tend to do things is, is probably just as big of a barrier, if not one. Um, and the same goes for, uh, there is a, another question um, regarding how available this information has been to other groups, such as persons living with disabilities, etc. cetera. Um, in, in, in Sweden, everything is signed sign language interpreted, um, all press conferences, etc. cetera. Um, and it's, uh, uh, press conferences are widely available on YouTube, etc. So I, I think we're trying to, but probably not perfect. I don't know if it's, it has been an issue somewhere else. So um, we now have um, passed that extra 15 minutes <laughs> and we have several questions and we have been discussing whether we should um, uh, uh, try to answer them and, and post them online for you to um, see our answers. Um, and uh, I will uh, make sure that that will happen somehow in the next couple of days. Um, so I guess you follow us on, on uh, the Twitter um, or Facebook um, and maybe we can um, share some information. I don't know exactly how you signed up for this that uh, answers are posted. Um, but uh, we thank you all for all the great questions and we will try to do our best to answer them. And um, with that, I would like to thank um, all the panelists. Thank you for participating. And of course, for our wonderful audience um, out there in uh, all over the world. And um, thank you for participating. And I hope that you felt that uh, it was uh, a well-spent 77 minutes. Uh, I don't know if that means anything, double seven. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, thank you for taking part. <laughs>